morning and welcome to our time of worship this morning. First Lord's Day in a new year and we uh, welcome you to this uh, time together worship. If you're visiting with us maybe for the first time, very warm welcome to you as well. And it's our prayer that even through uh, this virtual means that we would be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and that you would know uh, the Lord's rich blessing in the Christ the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's New Year and uh, often uh, so many people with a new year have some sense of hope and optimism uh, rekindled. Uh, they have some sense that uh, with a fresh start and a new beginning, hopefully things uh, might get better. And they may in different ways. We don't know what a day will hold, let alone a new year will hold. But the wonderful thing as Christians is that the Bible and the gospel is just filled with all sorts of new things that are really new and really true because of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the new birth, uh, being born from above. There's the new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things have been made new. There's uh, a new song that has been put into our mouths, a song of redemption. And there's the new heavens and the new earth that we look forward to. Uh, when Jesus comes again. So it's as believers, really, that every day and every Lord's Day, uh, let alone the first Lord's Day of a new year, that we have all of these wonderful new realities uh, to rejoice in and to be comforted in. And so the Lord bless you as we uh, worship together on this first Lord's Day of a new year. Let's spend a few moments silently in prayer, and uh, it's a time to ask the Lord to help us, the Holy Spirit to uh, work in our hearts to help us and prepare us as we come together and worship. Let us pray. Our great, holy, eternal, unchangeable God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the God who is eternal. Uh, you had no beginning, you'll have no end. Before the mountains were born or ever you had brought forth the, the earth, uh, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And Father, what a blessing it is to be able to know the unchangeable God because part of your unchanging nature is your unchanging faithfulness to your people in the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. That you have made promises to your people, that Jesus has done everything necessary to secure those promises for us as we come to him in faith, looking away from ourselves, looking away from our uh, good works and our sin, and simply looking to him, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, so that we could be saved, so that we could be delivered from shame and judgment and condemnation and enter into that new life, life in Christ, a life of hope and comfort and purpose, a life with a glorious destiny uh, to be uh, glorified and made like Christ perfectly, and then one day with a new resurrection body to enjoy the new heavens and the new earth, worshiping our great God and Savior. Father, every Lord's Day is another testimony to your faithfulness that this world will continue until all the elect have been gathered in, until the good shepherd has saved uh, all of the sheep, all of the lambs of his great flock. And Father, uh, we know that every day comes to us in your perfect providence, that you have foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, that we don't need to be afraid of bad news as our hearts are steadfast, trusting in you. And so, Father, as we come on another Lord's Day, a day of resurrection, reality, and hope, and comfort, and joy, Father, we, we pray that in Christ and for his sake, in his name, that you would bless your people who are worshiping you. And wherever they may be this morning, we think of the church in the world, especially the persecuted church, Lord, and we pray that you'd be near to them in a special way. 
but that you would draw near to us as well as we desire to draw near to you. And that as we glorify you in worship, that you would pour out a blessing upon your people. We pray these things, Lord, in humble reliance upon your spirit, asking that he'd help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray in the name of our prophet, priest, and king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our call to worship is from Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 57, and we read at verse 15, For this is what the high and lofty one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the the heart of the contrite. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. And so let's sing praise to God. Our opening Psalm is Psalm 145, the A selection. I give you praise, my God, O King, I will forever bless your name, I will extol you every day, and evermore your praise. confession and repentance and we are going to read first from James chapter 4 James chapter 4 I was speaking with a neighbor yesterday and uh, I brought up this verse beginning of a new year again especially in light of uh, last year and all the things that happened and uh, that were so unexpected uh, to everyone really uh, and we were just talking about life and I brought up this verse from James chapter 4, and I thought it would uh, be helpful to us as we come before the Lord in a prayer of confession this morning. So here's James chapter 4, verse 13. This is God's word. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while 
and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Let us pray. Lord God, our holy and righteous Father in heaven, the eternal God, we confess to you that you are God. There is no other. Uh, We are creatures. We are finite. Uh, We had a beginning, and uh, this life will end, Lord. We know that sin has entered the world, and the wages of sin is death. How thankful we are that the gift of God, your gift, is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And yet, Father, as we live in this world, we recognize that you are the only one who knows the end from the beginning. And it's very true. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. And so, Father, in this brief and uncertain life, How foolish it would be for us to boast about uh, things that we're going to do or or to think that we know uh, the future in detail about our lives. Father, keep us from that kind of pride and presumption. And we pray instead that the uncertainties of life would drive us even more to fall before you in worship, but also in trust and in comfort we don't know what a day holds but you do lord and we trust that as your children who come to you through faith in the lord jesus christ that you according to your promise are working all things together for the good of those who love you who are called according to your purposes so father we pray that we would more and more entrust ourselves to you that we would think and live uh, with Uh, these words of James in our minds. Uh, If it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. That especially, Father, when hard things come, unexpected things, things that we would never desire uh, ourselves in our own fallible wisdom to be brought into our lives, we pray that we'd submit ourselves, that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that you would lift us up in due time, Father, we pray that we would uh, be taught humility, that we would uh, be brought to a place in our lives, Father, where uh, we more and more trust in your wisdom for us. That you are doing things not just in our lives, but in in our families, in our congregation, in our communities, in the world. Father, that are far beyond our ability to completely understand why this particular thing happens or that particular relationship goes the way that it does. Father, we we just pray that forsaking pride, that in humility we, we trust you, our Father in heaven, that you do no wrong, that you are working out all your holy will, and that that will is good for us. Father, we we pray that as we begin a new year together, that we would begin it uh, as we are doing now in worship, and that we would continue to worship you every day of our lives in the way that we uh, humbly and joyfully submit ourselves to you in Christ. So Father, we pray that as we ask the forgiveness of our sins, that you'd work in us more and more Christ-likeness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn once again, and uh, we'll continue to sing in Psalm 145 about the grace and the compassion uh, that we have in the gospel uh, in Jesus Christ. 145, the B selection. Full of compassion
Our first scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, so I hope you have your Bibles there with you and you can open together with me as I read these words from Hebrews chapter 2 and we begin at verse 10. And we'll read on to the end of that chapter at verse 18. Hebrews 2, verse 10. Again, let's give our attention to the Holy Word of God. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The wonderful plan of salvation centered in Jesus Christ. What a wonder it is. We sing again, and if you're uh, there at home and you'd like to stand to sing, please do. Uh, 103, the B selection, we sing again of the mercy and the compassion of God as a father pities his children, uh, so the Lord pities those whom he loves and who love him. 103, B as in Benjamin, let's sing to God's praise. Bless the Lord, my soul, my whole heart, ever bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, forget not all his blessings to proclaim. He forgives all your transgressions, your diseases all he heals. He redeems you from destruction, and with you he kindly deals. He with love and mercy crowns you, satisfies your years with good, so that you will like the eagle with youth's figure be renewed. He shall intervene with justice for all those who are oppressed. For their sake the Lord takes action, governing in righteousness. He revealed his deeds to Israel and made Moses know his path. Lord of grace and full of pity, rich in love and slow to wrath, he will not continue striving nor be angry constantly. Has not dealt 
dealt with us as sinners, punishing iniquity. For as high as are the heavens, far above the earth below, just as great to those who fear him is the steadfast love he'll show. Far as east from west is distant, he has put away our sin. Like the pity of a father has the Lord's compassion been. Well, this morning we're going to continue looking at the passage that we were in a couple of weeks ago. We, we left it uh, halfway through, and so this morning and, Lord willing, this afternoon, uh, we'll complete our look at Isaiah chapter 9, and particularly in verse 6. But I'm going to read again Isaiah 9, beginning at the first verse to the end of verse 7. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on his word. Father, wherever we open this book, the Bible, the Holy Bible, we know that what the Bible says, you say. That every word has been breathed out of your mouth and is profitable to us for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. Father, we also know that as Jesus himself said, that all of this word speaks of him. And particularly, Lord, when we come to a passage like this, written uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, Lord, before Christ was born, and yet uh, so evidently, so indisputably speaking of him. Uh, Father, we pray that through the eyes of faith, as we hear your word, the ears of faith, that we'd see Christ, that we'd hear about Christ, that we'd learn from Christ, that we'd even hear his voice, the voice of our shepherd, speaking to us uh, because the, the sheep hear his voice they know his voice they recognize his voice and they follow him we wouldn't follow a stranger by your grace what a blessing that is to be able to uh, recognize the voice of christ as we hear holy scripture and that uh, you've kept us from following strangers uh, those who would teach false things that could only lead to our eternal destruction. Oh, thought, so Father, as we have this part of your word, may your spirit indeed give us ears to hear what he's saying as uh, he spoke long ago through the prophet Isaiah, and as these words are written down now uh, in your scriptures, uh, which will remain, which cannot be broken until everything is accomplished. Oh, Father, thank you for this word, and we pray for your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, let's give our attention now to the inerrant and infallible Word of God. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's as far as we read this morning in this part of God's Word. Well, I hope that you recall, if you're just joining with us this morning, you're, you're jumping on a moving train a little bit, but last uh, time we left off uh, together halfway through Isaiah 9, 6. These four names of Messiah prophesied long before his birth, but these names or titles of the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, who was promised and who would come. Uh, four names of Jesus beyond his personal name, Jesus. You will name him Jesus because he it is who will save his people from their sins. But four uh, additional titles of many, many, many titles that are given to Jesus in Scripture. But in preaching this verse, I felt a bit like uh, a footman. Uh, a footman, boys and girls, uh, was a servant in olden times. There may still be footmen somewhere in the world today. Uh, but uh, a footman was a servant of old who one of his jobs was to introduce guests who came to the house. I came across a quotation from a book called The Footman's Directory. I don't know if you've ever read about this in a, in a book or maybe seen it in a movie when people come and they're announced to the guests. But in The Footman's Directory, that they're announced as guests to the home. But in the footman's directory, it reads, when announcing visitors' names, it is to be done in an audible voice. Proper pronunciation was also important. Footmen were told, quote, if you do not rightly understand it, the name, ask a second time rather than make a blunder in giving a wrong one. Uh, what a job to have the names right as you introduce people. But, friends, Jesus Christ is revealed in Scripture by many names. And part of the purpose, at least, of preaching is to make those names known. To study them, to pray over them, and then to announce them to the house, to the church, and to the world. The name of the one who is actually the master of the house himself. Uh, what a job it is, but we should remember, and I need to remember, the servant is nothing. The footman isn't the focus. The one introduced is the focus. And nowhere is that more true and important than as we are introduced in scripture to the names of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because in Jesus, we meet the one who has the name that is above every name, Philippians chapter 2. All his names are glorious. They reveal wonderful things about him and about the blessings that he has purchased for his people. And it, it's such a blessing to know Jesus in all of his revealed names as we enter into another new year. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As believers in Christ, we can and we should have such comfort and confidence in him as we stand at the brink of another year or however many days the Lord will give us in this life. There are these four names then in Isaiah 9, verse 6. Boys and girls, I ask that uh, you'd be thinking about them and, and learning them and memorizing them. Uh, now with the, the lockdown, we aren't meeting together, so you can't come up and tell me if you know those names. But if you want to give me a call this week and uh, tell me over the phone uh, these four names, uh, that, that would be great. The first two names that we've already considered, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. These two names perhaps speak more of who he is. The next two names that we have, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, some suggest that perhaps these two names speak more of the blessings 
or the consequences of his work as Redeemer, as Messiah. And I think we'll see that that is, uh, is likely accurate. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Who is Jesus? Who is our Savior? Well, we see that he, we saw last time, he has the wisdom. He is the wisdom of God's plan of salvation. Wonderful Counselor. And he has the power to bring that wise and gracious plan to fruition, to completion. He is mighty God. But now we've come to these next two names. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We'll consider the first one this morning. And again, uh, Lord willing, the second one this afternoon. So here is his third name. The Son who is given unto us. A child is born. To us, a son is given. This son who was given is at the same time the everlasting father. That's his name or his title. Now, that may sound strange to us if we've never heard that or thought about that before. How is the son able to be called the everlasting father? We need to be careful here that we don't fall into what is called modalism or the heresy of modalism that God exists in three different modes. That was a, an unbiblical, a heretical way of understanding the biblical teaching of the Trinity. Modalism teaches that the Father revealed in the Old Testament became the Son revealed in the New Testament, who then became the Spirit in uh, the time following the New Testament uh, until the end. Uh, that's not the biblical teaching. Augustine famously said, if you want to see the Trinity, go to the Jordan. And he's referring to the baptism of Jesus, where uh, we see God the Son incarnate, and we hear the voice of the Father from heaven and the Spirit descending as a dove, and we see all three persons of the Trinity represented there at the same time. We don't believe in modalism, and so the uh, Father doesn't become the Son. That's not what's going on here in Isaiah 9, 6. This is not a confusion of the persons of the Godhead. Rather, it's a beautiful gospel title and description of Messiah. With respect to God, the Eternal Father, Jesus, in his person, is God, the Eternal Son, the same in substance, equal in power and in glory. But the point here in Isaiah 9, 6 is that with respect to us, as the church, as the people of God, Jesus acts in part as our spiritual Father for eternity our gospel father for eternity. Now, how is that true? I think we need to remember very basically as human beings, our first father was Adam. And we bear his likeness. He was created in the image of likeness of God. Even because of sin, we still bear that image and likeness of God, though distorted, ruined by sin. Uh, now we are sadly fallen in sin, and we bear that likeness as well as the descendants of Adam born in sin, conceived in iniquity, Psalm 51. But the Bible tells us Jesus is the last Adam. He comes as a new covenant head. Adam was the head of the covenant of works. Jesus comes in the covenant of grace as the covenant head of a new humanity in him. Adam is our first father the covenant of works. Christ is, as it were, then our second father in the covenant of grace. Sin made us orphans, estranged from our creator because of our sin and rebellion. But Jesus says in the upper room in John 14, I will not leave you orphans. Listen closely to a well-known passage in Isaiah later on, Isaiah 53. Listen closely as we Think about this title of Jesus, Everlasting Father. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, 
He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Or the passage that we read from the New Testament already this morning in Hebrews chapter 2. As the writer, the author to the Hebrews is uh, pointing out how Christ is better. And he's bringing these passages from the Old Testament to speak of Christ. Hebrews 2.13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. That's a quotation, interestingly, from Isaiah 8, verse 18. So just in the chapter before our verse in chapter 9, verse 6, uh, God has this passage in the author to the Hebrews applies it to Christ. Here am I and the children whom God has given me. And so there is a sense that in the gospel, as the uh, father of a new humanity, the covenant head of a new humanity, Christ is the everlasting father. The other sense, though, that this theme of father may be taken is this, that eternity is the blessing of which Jesus is the author or the source or the Father. There is a bit of parallelism here, I think. Wonderful Counselor. The Wonderful describes the Counselor. Mighty God. The Mighty describes God. But then in the second two titles, we could read them this way, that these are in fact the blessings that Christ has come to uh, provide for his people. He is the Father of Everlasting. And he is the Prince of Peace. We see it more clearly in the Prince of Peace. But it may be that sense to it, Everlasting Father, that rather than uh, describing him, because it's not the usual word for everlasting or eternal here, just a preposition that's expanded out into this forever. It's uh, sometimes translated as far as, uh, but here Everlasting. But he's the Father of Everlasting as he is the Prince of Peace. In fact, many of the, the older commentators would translate it this way. Instead of Everlasting Father, they would translate something like the Father of Eternity or the Father of Everlasting. How, how does that work out? How are we to understand that? Well, we use that language sometimes. We're familiar with it. The Father of Modern Physics, we'd say. Albert Einstein sometimes is called the father of modern physics. It's interesting, Einstein himself called Galileo the father of modern physics. But both these men, Einstein, Galileo, were men who tried to plumb the depths of time and space. But in Jesus, we have the father of everlasting, the father of eternity. The Bible tells us that in his hands, in the hands of Messiah Jesus, are the keys of eternity, heaven and hell. But especially in the context of the gospel, he is the father of e the eternal blessed life that he has purchased for his people, his children. He's the father of everlasting blessing for his children. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus is the father of immortality as the savior of his people. Or Hebrews chapter 5 at verse 8. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The source of eternal salvation. The father of of everlasting, the father of ever, 
lasting. John Calvin said, Christ bestows immortality on the body, his body, the church, and its members. He's the father of everlasting. This life is a breath. It's a mist that appears. We read that in James chapter 4. A mist that appears and is vanishing so quickly. I wonder as we think about this glorious title of Jesus, the Father of Everlasting. I wonder if you're someone who's just living for the now. You're just looking ahead to the next thing, the next season of your life. But friends, the Bible repeatedly calls people, people who in, especially because of sin, are just living for the now. It calls us to think about the eternal then. What good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Jesus spoke so often about hell and about heaven, those eternal realities, to warn you and to call you to himself, the father of eternity. In Christ, you see, trusting in Christ, who has dealt with the sin that was our condemnation, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Trusting in Christ, we've uh, gone from death to life. We've crossed over. And he has come to give us life and life eternal, he says, as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. In Christ, the thought of eternity is, is meant in Scripture to be a great comfort to the people of God. Spiritually and even physically, eternity is a great comfort to us. Eternity, the blessed eternity of the people of God, is the great reality, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, it is the great reality that outweighs what he calls these light momentary afflictions that we all experience in this life. As heavy as they seem and feel now, as long as they seem to endure now, when you put them in the way scale of a blessed eternity and you reevaluate them, then you see with the eyes of Paul these light, momentary afflictions. What a comfort this is. Calvin again says, when new terrors spring up suddenly and when many deaths threaten us from various quarters, let us rely on that eternity of which Christ is with good reason called the Father, and that by that comfort we would be soothed in all our temporal distresses. What a blessing to know and to trust Jesus Christ as the Father of your everlasting. And so in the Gospel, Christ, Hebrews chapter 2, is in some ways our elder brother, He's also like a father to us, now and forever. His kingdom will have no end. From that time on and forever, it says in verse 7. This name calls us, this name, Everlasting Father, Father of Everlasting, calls us to meditate on Christ, our everlasting gospel father. I thought as a little bit of a side road that this is a reminder for us as elders of the church. If Christ has a sense of being the father of his people in the gospel, it's a reminder for elders of the church as we minister in Christ's name. We think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and what Paul wrote, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. That's the gospel ministry. That's what elders are to be doing in the church. That's how people in the church are to be receiving gospel ministry through the elders in Christ's name, encouraging, comforting, 
urging you to live lives worthy of God. Uh, that's an application for elders, but there's so much here for each one of us personally as believers. As we think about Jesus, the Father of everlasting. Uh, th there are many ways that I find sermons that deal with the theme of fathers uh, difficult. I find them difficult because of the range of experiences of anyone who may be listening this morning and what thoughts that word father may evoke in your, your mind, uh, in your experience. Uh, I trust many of you have many good recollections about your father, uh, but there are also many bad experiences that people have had with human fathers, horrible, evil experiences. We need to recognize that as we come to this theme, but it should, it should have us just uh, love this name of Jesus even more. Uh, you know, personally as well, I'm, I'm very aware of my own failures as a father. Uh, I don't know if it's your experience, fathers, but, but there's a sense that we know we never really live up to, to the Father's Day cards that were graciously given often year after year. That's why I'm so thankful that I'm a Christian before I'm a father. I'm a forgiven sinner as a father. It's my only hope. It's also why I'm so thankful in the gospel that beyond my own earthly father, uh, who was once so strong, but now is so frail, I'm so thankful that both of us, both my father, and I have Christ, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity. What a wonderful Father in the gospel Jesus is to us. How fatherly he was to the disciples when he was on the earth. How patient he was. How long-suffering. How encouraging. How correcting. At times rebuking. Yet always faithful in his nurturing love for them. Do you know the comfort of Jesus as the Father of eternity? What, what are those comforts? Well, first, it's the comfort of a father's presence. How much do we hear about absentee dads, absentee fathers in our culture? It's a plague in our societies. How often children long for their father's presence, but at times those fathers can be too busy. They put work before their children, uh, some never knowing their father at all. But who is Jesus to us? He is Emmanuel, God with us. That's the name revealed of Jesus in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 1.23. And it's what Jesus himself says at the end of Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 8.20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A father's presence. But in Jesus, we also have a father's provision. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If anyone does not provide for his own, his own family, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. But Jesus has provided, and he provides for us, doesn't he? Jesus gives us what we need physically every day and spiritually especially. Even more spiritually, he provides the bread of life. He provides living water. He provides clothing, the robes of righteousness. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness is provided by Jesus, in Jesus. He daily provides mercy and forgiveness. His, his mercies are new every morning until the day when we will be glorified. And we will no longer need to pray, forgive us our debts. He's the father of provision. He's also a father who pities us. And we sang about that in Psalm 103. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. He's, he's a father who pities his children in the gospel. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
You know, you think of Luke 15, the prodigal son. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And Jesus says, come to me, all you are heavy burdened. He pities us. He's also the father of perfect discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. You know, with providential, with the providential discipline of God in Christ, the things that come to us in our life, we also have the assurance of Jesus' prayers for us. How a father prays for his children, that through all of the providences of life, God would be working good for it in their lives. Jesus prays for us. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus, in his disciplining and chastising providence, in all parts of his providence, is mingling his prayers. He ever lives. He ever lives to intercede for us. He's the Father of everlasting. And lastly, he is the father who protects us. He is the father that will safely bring you home. On earth, Jesus prayed, all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer. This was in the high priestly prayer, John 17. But I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus is like a father that protects his children and ultimately sees them safely home. Once, uh, I remember when I was a teenager, and it wasn't something really very serious at all. I don't want to uh, make it too dramatic, melodramatic. It wasn't that serious at all. But once when I was a teenager, I needed to call my dad. I needed to uh, call my father. It was late at night. I, I'm sure I woke him up. I needed to call him to come get me. I was so thankful to know as much as an inconvenience and a disturbance as it was, and I heard a little bit about that, but and it was my fault. I needed to. I was so thankful to know that he would come, and that he'd take me home. But beloved, Jesus is the good shepherd who seeks and saves the lost, saving them to the uttermost. Came across a story this past week of a man named. Yu Ju Kang. He's 40 years old. He's a single father from the Sichuan province in China. He walks nine miles to school every day with his son, Zhao Chang. But what makes this story especially remarkable is that his 12 year old son has a disorder that has made his arms and legs twisted and his back is very hunched over. He can't walk and there's no public transportation available to take him to school. His father carries his son strapped to his back so that his son can get to school every day. Yu wakes up every day at 5 a.m., makes lunch for his son, and then straps Zhao Chang, who is about three feet tall, in a basket that he carries on his own back. The pair make the four and a half mile trek to school over rugged terrain. 
uh, and then you walks back home so that he can work all day. Then this devoted father returns to pick up literally his boy from school and carries him all the way home. An 18 mile round trip every day. The father estimates he's already walked about 1,600 miles since he started taking his son to school. You, the father, vow to do everything in his power to make sure his son would get there every day. As remarkable as that is, uh, it, it really pales in comparison to the father that we have in Jesus in the gospel. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Beloved, uh, we too often think that we're, we are strong. We can so often rely on our own strength. Little do we know how much we are carried in the Christian life, carried home to eternity, because underneath, are the everlasting arms. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Everlasting Father. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we praise and thank you that you love the world in such a great way that you were willing to give your own son, that you did not spare him, but gave him up for us all. How will you not also with him freely give us all things? What a, what a blessing it is to know Jesus savingly and to know this title, Father of Everlasting, that in the gospel he has provided for us an everlasting life, an everlasting eternity a blessing in the new heavens and the new earth. Father, we pray that gospel realities would be foremost in our thinking, that it would be through the gospel and through the lens of the names and titles of our Savior that we process everything in our lives, every experience, every relationship, every decision, every hope and plan, every providence. And Father, we, we thank you that we have your word. We pray that as we begin a new year again, that we recommit ourselves to being people of the book, that it would be your word that would be the light to our path and the lamp to our feet. Pray, Father, that as your people together in the church, we would, we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We pray that we'd be made more like him week by week and day by day. Father, we are so thankful that as our uh, Father, you do provide for us everything that we need. It may not be everything we want, but it's everything that we need as you work out your perfect plan and will in our lives. Father, we, we pray that whatever you may be bringing to us physically, Lord, in terms of sicknesses, illnesses, diseases, handicaps of various kinds. Father, and spiritually, the things that, that come to us in the relationships of life. Father, we, we just pray that you'd, you'd be working these things for good in our lives, that we'd be seeing more of our sin and seeing more of our Savior, and that we'd be uh, more conformed to him as we experience these things. We pray for those in our midst who are suffering in different ways. You know them, Lord. We, we do pray that you give daily grace and comfort for the struggles that they face. 
we pray for those who are who have been touched by uh, COVID in different ways. Father, that you'd be using this in their lives as well. We pray that you'd be merciful and that the, the effects of this virus would be, would be uh, held in check, Lord. Um, but we know that isn't always the case. We pray that we'd be submitting ourselves to you. Father, we, we pray for your church in the world. We pray for our sister denominations. We think of the church in France and Andrew Little is a pastor there in the Mission Church in Nantes and how they are planning for a new building. We pray for grace as they do that, even as we are so thankful uh, for the place that you provided for us. We pray that you watch over us in that uh, building renovation, that you give safety and, uh, and wisdom and strength and uh, unity, Lord, as we engage in this project. But we pray that we keep in mind the grand purpose and plan of it all, that your kingdom would come your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that people would hear about Jesus and bend their knee before him and confess him with their tongues that he is Lord and their Lord. Father, we pray that you'd uh, help us as we uh, work through these restrictions that are on us from our government. Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to see things uh, biblically and properly and to, to make good decisions. Uh, give wisdom to the elders of your church. And Father, we, we pray that you'd be merciful and that you'd lift these things from us and that we could join together again in worship very soon. Father, please bless this day to your people. We pray, Father, uh, that it would be a day of rest and gladness and of gospel um, growth for us in Jesus Christ. Help us to know him better. We pray in his name. Our closing psalm is Psalm uh, 48, 48, the C selection. Let's sing together uh, as we uh, sing this Psalm 48, C. Thus may generations tell for what a God is he. He is our God forevermore who guides eternally. Let's sing it in the name of Jesus the Father of our everlasting. 48, the C selection. Within your temple we have thought upon your love, O God. As is your name, O God, your praise is spread through earth abroad. As is your name, O God, your praise is spread through earth abroad. Your right hand holds all righteousness, Mount Zion's joy be great. Let Judah's daughters joyfully your judgment celebrate. Let Judah's daughters joyfully your judgment celebrate. And circle Zion, walk about, and mark her towers well. Consider her protective walls, behold her citadels. Consider her protective walls, behold her citadels. Thus you may generation sell. For what a God is He, He is our God forevermore, who guides eternally. He is our God forevermore, who guides eternally. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Go with the blessing of our triune God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit of God be with you all now and forever.